co-hosts as we welcome them back for the second hour of the program. They are two finely dressed Southern gentlemen, Delegate Michael Hott. Good morning. <laughs> and extra crispy, Matt Harvey. Hello. Good morning, prosecutor. <laughs> Good morning. And uh, a new addition to the uh, program. Call me, call me Matlock. <laughs> two T's. I like that. Yeah. Uh, that is kind of like a Matlock suit. Yeah. Yes, it is. Yeah. It very hot wherever he was whatever courtroom he was in yeah yeah the old the old ones don't have air conditioning like no like, like um i don't know i mean it's not like they probably have air conditioning but it's not like in the traditional sense you know when you're retrofitting a building from the 1800s <laughs> they have windows is what they yeah have. they have a window <laughs> fans i grew up in yeah, churches fans. without air yeah. conditioning and uh-huh. i remember the first time our church got ac that was a great day uh, <laughs> in, in my home county when uh when a logging truck would come through you'd have to just stop and wait till it, it got through the too much stoplight and then because it was too because you couldn't hear yeah. you literally could not hear sure you have a dozen donuts in front of you yes how'd those get there well i i think that would be our next guest right let's welcome in christine glover <laughs> autographed candidate yeah the yeah. camera's trying to there you go uh-huh. camera's going crazy for donuts yeah you, like, like, yeah <laughs> it went up into the sky uh, judicial candidate christine glover chris good morning pull that mic a little closer to you there good morning you go by chris correct yes mm-hmm. all right very good and you're running for family court judge yes which district um it's district 24 it covers all of jefferson and all of berkeley county okay and how long is this term this term would be eight years an eight-year term you ran previously in 2016 correct yeah, and that was a fairly close race, was it not? Yes, it was. I actually won Berkeley County, and they announced in the paper that I had won family court judge. But but when you put the votes together for Berkeley and Jefferson, I did not win. So Judge okay. Jackson remained as the family court judge. And there's a rumor that you once taught a child of one of the co-hosts in this room. Yes, I did. Probably many of them. Um, yeah. and, th- and that's how Chris and I first met is I can remember going in, I think it was probably their freshman year, and you used to teach Spanish at, at Hedgesville High School, and they had the orientation, and I went in uh, to her class, and I, I distinctly remember it because she spent like the first 10 minutes speaking to all the parents in Spanish, and I didn't understand a word she said. <laughs> and then when she was finished that, she just sat there and smiled, and she goes, and this is what your children are going to have to deal with over the next year. <laughs> it's a good way to teach it. Yeah, it, yeah absolutely. It was. Immerse it. Yes. Right. So I was impressed. So you were a teacher and then you decided to go to law school? Is actually, that how that worked? Actually, yes. I was a teacher and then I went to law school. Yeah, mm-hmm. How long did you teach? Um, I taught at Hedgesville High School. But I actually was a, I was a teacher. Then I went to law school. Then I went back to being a teacher. Mm-hmm. And then, mm-hmm. Yeah. So. But, I taught at Hedgesville High School. I taught at Spring Mills High School. I coached basketball at South Middle School, Jefferson High School. Mm-hmm. And you ref basketball and as I well. I ref basketball, yeah. yeah. I've been a, a basketball official in this area since 2004. Where did you go to high school? I went to high school, gosh, I went to four different high schools. I actually started off in, oh, I started off in PG County at the Science and Technology, Eleanor Roosevelt. Mm-hmm. It's um. It, they bring all the kids in for science and technology. Yep. That's right. And so I started off there. Then I went to Laurel High School. Then I went to the Catholic school, Pilates. Yep. And then my parents moved to Frederick County, Maryland. So I graduated from Middletown High School. Oh, you were a knight. Yes. Yes, I was. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Wait, you see my shirt? Oakdale? Yes. Yeah. In Frederick, yep. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah, my dad actually retired after teaching 43 years as a, as a middle school teacher. He is the most patient, kind man <laughs> ever. <laughs> So you're a teacher, and then you decide law school might be an option. What drove that? Um, basically, by, by being a teacher, I thought maybe if I could get a law degree. I mean, I went to law school because I wanted to do child abuse and neglect, and I wanted to do family law. That was why I went to law school. Um, and in law school, I actually served as a rape and domestic violence uh, counselor for six years. I served as a court-appointed special advocate for four years. And that was the whole reason why I went to law school. I wanted to help families. I wanted to help children. And when I got out of law school, I did that. I was working as a guardian ad litem. And the first time that I sent my vouchers to the state to get paid, I got a letter back in the mail that said, the state currently does not have funds to pay you. We'll pay you at a later date. And it quickly became apparent that that type of work wasn't going to work with trying to make my mortgage payment. Mm -hmm. So, um, And even recently, with all the budget here, I... 
it took till I submitted my vouchers and I didn't get paid for 2024 until recently this month like this week for 2024 was my first pay wow. for was my first um, you know for the court appointed cases does that come out of the judicial budget or DHS or what Mike? yeah I'm pretty sure it comes out of judicial budget but I, I'm that's I'm surprised by that because we we talk about uh, guardians ad litem a lot and and the funding for them. So um, I thought they they it, got prioritized. Yeah, I, I thought so on, too. On so I mean, if you're if it's still lagging behind, that's then bad. We absolutely then. need to do something about that. That's Maybe good. fire somebody. I mean, when I called down, that was what they said that the legislation the legislation still hadn't signed the budget, and that when they re yeah, that was. Well, that's a possibility because we had all the issues with the budget this this particular session and the clawbacks and uh, a lot of things got pushed out, um, which is why we're coming back in May to to try to fix the budget. So, uh, Chris, uh, tell us uh, why you want to be a judge now. I am running for family court judge because as a former school teacher and basketball coach, I saw firsthand the devastating consequences that divorce and unhealthy parental relationships had on children. And I want to work to preserve families. I want to work to protect the well-being of our families in the community. Mr. Height. Well, let's, let's talk a little bit. We all often um, on this show talk about in political races, um, by voting for you, you're asking us to fire the person who's in there, the incumbent. So what is it that makes you um, different or better than the current judge we have? Um, if you are content with traditional litigation and that contested, antagonistic, combative um, way that co family court is being conducted today, then by all means, don't vote for me. I, I want to change the way that we do family court. I want to see alternative dispute resolution used more often. I would what like is that, Christine? Alternative dispute resolution could be mediation. It could be a cooperative divorce. It could be a collaborative divorce. But it a lot of times couples can... And I want to empower couples to make the decisions for their children so that they can collaborate in a cost-effective manner. This saves the taxpayers money. It saves the, the, the community members money uh, when they can pretty much decide what's in the best interest of their own children and come to that court for just, you know, a final hearing. That way they get to decide. For example, let me give you, um, let's say you're – Let's say your son plays football on Wednesdays. Well, why have a uh, why have a parenting plan where the child never gets to be with dad on Wednesdays if dad's a football coach and he'd really like to be there on you know be able to see his kid play you know football? As a basketball coach, one of the things we we started doing recently, um, we we had to make weekends like let's say Saturdays no longer a mandatory practice because so many kids were involved in parenting plans that took them you know, a way that they could not be present, let's say, for a Saturday practice because their parenting plans or their court orders did not say that, you know, the other parent had to honor the extracurricular activity of that child that that child ch chose to participate in, for example. Mr. Hyde, back to you. I just have to say real quick, my daughter posted on here, you one of her favorite teachers. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Did she do it in Spanish? Uh, uh, no, because if she had, I wouldn't be able to read it. <laughs> <laughs> But, but she I'm, could, but she could. Which is gracias. Could. Yes. Which is gracias. <laughs> Mr. Harvey. I lawyer to lawyer. Well, yeah, but look, this is an area of law that I know nothing about. I very I mean just a little bit about. But um you're talking about those uh agreed upon parenting plans. Um what is that an option that's already available to litigants? Well, here's the thing. When you file for a divorce in, in West Virginia, you're pitting mom against dad is what you're doing. It's, it's contested. We don't even have an option for them to file an agreed order and or agreed petition. Believe me, believe me, I've tried. <laughs> so, yeah, we don't have that option currently in West Virginia for mom. Let's say mom and dad get together. They've decided everything outside of court. So all they need to do is file that final, you know, agreed final order. Well, they can't do that. That's not an option. So um, is that is that a way to protect them to have it come in and, and being looked at? with a judicial eye to make sure that someone's not getting over on the other one or absolutely absolutely and, and one of the things our neighboring states is doing is um collaborative law i don't know if you're familiar with the concept of yes collaborative i am familiar with that okay yes. so what they do is you know 
they have financial experts that work with the couple. They have mental health experts, child specialists. They get those wraparound mm. services in place for the children and for the family so that they can uncouple in a healthy manner and address the, you know, the concerns that, that are going on in that relationship. So what about so oh, excuse me yeah. so you're saying right now that the way the law is written or, or the way it's practiced by the judges they're they're it, it sort of intentionally puts one against the other so so that there is um some animosity correct i mean you're going to go in and you're going to pay paint your wife as an alcoholic a drug addict you know unfit to be a mom she's going to come in and say that you are the word i mean that's pretty much how it is you're putting one parent against the other and they are fighting and portraying each other in the most negative horrific light you could possibly imagine hmm. and you have attorneys that are often trying to push the button of the other one to make you know to portray that person in a very negative light which is not in the best interest of children you know, we should have a family court that's future focused. We should have a family court that work helps empower couples to make decisions and work together, not tear them apart and tear them down. What are all the types of cases that go before family court, Christine? Have, okay, you have divorce, you have grandparent visitation, you have annulment, um, you have uh, separate maintenance, custodial allocation, you, um, you also have the division of property. Do you, so, do you, oh, oh, I'm sorry. So one second, Matt. Parenting uh, plans, yeah. Uh, how, do, how do these cases go from the magistrate level to the court level? What well, progresses for, one to the next? Well, with a magistrate, you, for, for, for example, a family court also hears the final domestic violence protection orders, but they would have started off in magistrate. That would be an example of one that would progress from magistrate over to family court, so does, domestic violence. Does the magistrate make the decision as to whether the order should be issued, and then like from it, there it goes to the circuit court? Right. It would be The magistrate would make the decision with regards to a temporary domestic violence order, and then the family court would hear the final domestic violence order so that would be an example of one progressing from magistrate over to the family court gotcha now mr harvey what's your opinion on a family courts hearing abuse and neglect cases family court hearing abuse and neglect um i'm very fortunate i have amazing judges that i, I think do a great job with my family with child abuse and neglect cases i appear before judge mclaughlin and judge redding and they both do a very very nice job with their child abuse and neglect docket uh that's that's a good question i i don't I'm, i mean i'm family court hearing abuse and neglect i i would be in favor of it obviously uh but i do think that the judge the two judges here in berkeley county that i appear before i think they do a great job we have a delegate in the room and an attorney in the room, prosecuting attorney Matt Harvey. So we have a situation in the state of West Virginia in regards to children in foster care, which has been described as at a crisis level in many situations. And you've dealt with it firsthand as well as an attorney. What would be your way of helping this problem progress to moving toward it being not solved, but at least on a path to a better outcome? Well, for one, we need definitely more mental health. Um, my brother is the outpatient supervisor at Mountain Air Recovery Center, and so he and he also worked at the Day Report Center, and so we definitely need more mental health professionals in this area. Right now, for example, for the child abuse and neglect cases, we send all of our all of our parents off to Romney eastern regional psychological services for evaluations uh for psychological evaluations and parenting assessments we don't have anyone local that we're sending people to for uh psychological evaluations and parenting assessments we we are constantly looking for mental health professionals and there's waits i mean months two months and even our psychological reports we're, i mean we're they're breaking up three four months it's hard to get services in place and help for a family when we can't even get the recommendations from a psychological report back for four months uh looking for beds for people that have addiction problem i mean looking for beds you know to, to help people i mean sure we can send them over to berkeley county medical center for detox but then we're trying to find beds and facilities for people to you know get the help they need with their addictions so definitely more services here in the eastern panhandle to help families with the the issues and problems that they're having what about foster care issues foster care issues that's a hard one um do you, do you deal with that in most of your cases absolutely yes i mean it's hard because you have great we, we do have some great foster parents and then obviously on the other hand we have some that that there there's been issues and problems and probably don't have enough 
Right. Right. Mm-hmm. Exactly. That's exactly right. We don't. We don't have enough foster care parents. We don't have enough. What can we do at the state level to help that scenario? I know. Uh, what was it about four years ago, Mike? They raised the stipend for foster parents. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah. Foster care parents. Uh, does that need to be addressed again? Would that help? recruit more foster parents? Well, I mean, obviously we don't want people doing it for monetary reasons. We want people doing it because they're, you know, wanting to offer a home. I mean, and that's a lot of times the best foster care parents are the ones that, you know, want to provide that permanent home to the child, not the ones that are doing it for monetary reasons. No, but you also don't want to do it and go in debt. This is true. Helping. Yeah. yeah. Right? This is true. I think the, the bigger problem with, when it comes to foster care, and we have a couple of delegates who, who are foster parents, um, and a lot of what they talk about is communication and communication between all of the, the uh, stakeholders um, in the foster care system. And there are times when they would get a child um, and from the state and and not know anything not have any any information about the child at all they would just show up with a bag and there might be medicine in the bag and they have no idea how to give the medicine or or anything and you know when they start asking questions the answer is I don't know either so mm-hmm. Um, I think one of the big things over the past couple of years is um, they've created a portal to try to put all of the information on an individual child uh, into that portal where all of the stakeholders can can feed, feed the information in and, and try to help that way. That, that, that seemed to be their focus. It was less about money and more about communication and information for the children that they're taking care of. I was gonna say, in my cases, we, we keep the foster care parents involved. They're part of the MDT, they're part of the multidisciplinary team meeting because you know each one of these meetings and court hearings, one of the things we wanna know is how are the children doing? And if the children are placed in a foster, in a, with a foster family, well, we want that foster family to be part of that that whole process you know in case for any reason there's a breakdown and it doesn't look like reunification with the biological parents is going to take place then obviously our permanency plan wants to be with the foster parents so we want the foster parents part of the process the entire way and we always want that update at the court hearing and at the MDT how are the children doing what percentage of the cases that you deal with involve foster situations Roughly. Roughly. Um, gosh, maybe, I would say about 50, 50%. So about half. But um, yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm just saying, because I have a lot of, of family, I have a lot of, that are also um, kinship placements, so I'm mm-hmm. not including right. the kinship placements with that foster. So I would, say about 50, I would say about 50 is foster and about 50 is kinship. And, and then the cases that you deal with where there's kids who are in need of some other home for a while, whether it's a foster care home or a kinship placement, how many of those cases are a result of people who need to be in recovery or, or are in recovery or dealing with addiction in some way? Oh, that's good. Um, Is it most? I'd say, I'm going to go with 75, maybe, that, 75%. Wow. Yeah, uh-huh. I mean, I have a good number that have the scram bracelets on that are going to DRC. Yes, I'd All say right. about 75. So, so knowing this information from your perspective as an attorney now, Let's say you win the election and you're on the bench. How does this information help you when you're making decisions as a judge? It helps me because, I, one, I'm familiar with the resources in our community. Um, and, 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 yeah, I would say definitely having a knowledge of our community, the resources in the community definitely helps. Are most judges aware of the situation as, let's say, as thoroughly as you might be from an attorney who's been on the other side of the bench? Uh, that would that would be a question for the judges. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> what's been your what's been your you said you've had good experiences with Judge McLaughlin and, and Judge Redding, and whatever they seem to be up. Yeah, to speed they're with very that. familiar. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, for example, Judge Red, um, uh, in one of my cases recently, Judge McLaughlin referred a, a, a mother to a parent navigator over at Casa. Well, Casa will do parent navigation, but they only do it for. Um, they have settlement money for opioid cases. So for this particular case, for example, she they, we couldn't use CASA for a parent navigator because it wasn't a case involving opioids. Hmm. Mr. Harvey, do you have a question for Ms. Glover before we move yeah, on? Yeah, you mentioned something about uh, trivia oh. earlier. <laughs> oh, I think I answered some of the questions, but let's try. All right, so family court. What counties does family court cover? Well, yeah, yeah, yeah. Berkeley and Jefferson. Very well, good. all of them. 
Yeah. You said what? Oh, okay. Sorry, yeah. sorry. Uh, the <laughs> Trick question. Good job. All right. How many divisions do we have? How many divisions? In the mm-hmm. whole state? Uh, how many divisions do we have locally for Berkeley and Jefferson two, County? Two. Oh, well, just one. Two. How many divisions? Yeah. How oh, many I'm divisions? sorry. Four. Very good. Four. We, Four. It went from three, and then in 2020, well, it's three right now. In January 1st, 2025, it'll go to four. Very good. Yes. Mm-hmm. So in Division One, we have, I'm, I'm running in Division One, and I'm running mm-hmm. against um, David Camaletti. Mm-hmm. Division Two and Three are both uncontested, and that is, who? oh, who do we have in Division Two and Three? I know this, obviously. <laughs> Go ahead. Rich Stevens and Lindsay Matchett. Very good, yes. And then we have Division Four, which is op- it's our brand new division. Right. Mm-hmm. Yes. And that's uh, Carmela Cesare and Laura Sutton's running in that one. Yes. Yeah, Laura will be in soon. We had Carmela in earlier this week, and she brought a uh, freshly baked cherry pie, I might add, oh, too. Oh, wow. Yeah. Uh, so this this is our final minute. Uh, go ahead and uh, talk into your camera in front of you and let everyone know why they should vote for you for judge. Hi, my name is Christine Glover. Please um, go to my Facebook page, follow me. I am com- I am not taking any financial contrib- donations or contributions or financial endorsements, so please, I am relying on you, my community members, former students, former basketball players. Please go to my Facebook page, follow me, share it, encourage others to vote for me on May 14th. I would very much like to see a future-focused, child-centered family court where we empower couples to collaborate in a cost-effective manner. So please help me serve you as your family court judge. Thank you. All right. More nervous arguing your first case or being on this program? Oh, my goodness. I was definitely nervous my first case. Mm. I felt more comfortable I here with you guys today than arguing my first case. Good answer. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. Uh, Christine Glover. Because our suits are so soothing to the eyes. <laughs> they are. It they is. Are. It's that calming. <laughs> it's a very calming effect. Bless your heart. You'll be okay, darling. <laughs> Thank you very Chris much. Chris Glover, thanks so much. <laughs>